Good afternoon, and welcome to State of Mind, a forum on the intellectual life of American Catholics. I'm Pat DeLue. Let's begin with a welcome from our president, William P. Leahy of the Society of Jesus. Father Leahy. Thank you, Pat. I do want to say a word of welcome to all of you gathering here this afternoon for this symposium. And if you think about all that's gone on in the years since 1955 when Monsignor Ellis wrote that essay on American Catholicism and its intellectual life, which appeared in Thought, the Fordham University publication, so much has gone on. Uh, when you think of what was happening in the American church at the midpoint of the 20th century, we were dealing with the effects of World War II and the earlier waves of immigration. Clearly there were lingering effects of prejudice. And then we had this huge expansion going on of Catholic colleges and universities. And I think when we look back on where we have come from, I think it's fair to say Catholic higher education in the United States has come a long way. We do a much better job, I think, of educating students today. We certainly have better facilities. We're better endowed. And I think, in particular, we do a better job of teaching philosophy and theology. But we also know there's a lot more to be done. And at a place like BC or whatever the Catholic college or university might be, there is a serious commitment to engaging the wider culture and mediating between that culture and the church and vice versa. This afternoon we have the opportunity of hearing from three distinguished academics about their observations on what has gone on since Monsignor Ellis's essay and all of the discussion that it provoked and maybe we'll have a chance to hear their observations on how do we strengthen not only Catholic intellectual life, which I define as broader than just what happens in the universities and colleges that are Catholic, but it's the culture of Catholicism. And how might Catholic colleges and universities help renew the church? Because as we all know, our church today very much needs renewal. And I've said to more than one audience, what happens on the campuses of Catholic colleges and universities, I think will be a decisive factor in what happens in regard to the renewal of Catholicism in the United States. So I look forward to this discussion, and I'm glad that you are here to be part of this afternoon on the Boston College campus. So welcome, and I look forward to what this panel has to say to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Your program notes give you a short synopsis about, of what we're about this afternoon. It was just 50 years ago that the eminent church historian John Tracy Ellis, in his book, American Catholics and the Intellectual Life, while acknowledging the anti-intellectual tenor of the entire time, bemoaned the particular failure of the American Catholic Church, despite its wealth and despite its size, quote, to produce national leaders and to exercise commanding influence in intellectual circles. Although Ellis acknowledged the anti-Catholicism prevalent at many times in American history, and the poverty of immigrants who were the majority of Catholics during most of American history, he bemoaned the fact that the American Catholic Church lacked an intellectual tradition. American Catholics, again admittedly like their non-Catholic fellow citizens, did not read seriously, and were far too concerned with commerce and finance, according to Ellis. American Catholic bishops and priests were the victims of poor seminary education. American Catholic universities were too many, too poor, and generally mediocre. These Catholic universities could count very few scholars, as distinguished in publications such as American Scientists of Note, among their graduates though Ellis admitted that they produced a fair number of medical doctors and lawyers. Ever the good historian, Ellis concluded his recitation of failures by asking, why is it so? And he found two causes for the dearth of American Catholic intellectuals. One is the timidity and inferiority that typifies the ghetto mentality that was still prevalent, according to Ellis, 
among Catholics of the 1950s. The other, interestingly, I think, is the Catholic lack of industry and habits of work, to use Ellis's phrase. Genuine, first-rate scholarship, Ellis noted from long personal experience, is very hard work. We should express thanks to Ben Birnbaum and the staff of the Boston College Office of Marketing Communications for organizing this afternoon's forum. Today we will ask, now, 50 years later, what is the state of American Catholic scholarship and intellectual life? Are we still lagging somehow behind our non-Catholic countrymen? A small personal note here that leads me to think that the answer may be somewhat generationally determined. I asked my graduate church history class last semester to read and react to the Ellis article that preceded his book of the same title. My students, all in their 20s and early 30s, thought the piece interesting, a bit hyperbolic, and as much a relic of a distant and very different past as the writings of the Church Fathers and the decrees of the Council of Trent. Not one of them thought that Ellis could be describing his or her own experience as an American Catholic. Our speakers this afternoon will raise some fundamental questions. What is Catholic scholarship? Was Ellis posing the right questions and measuring American Catholics by the right measures? How should Catholics contribute to American public intellectual life? After they speak, it will be our turn to engage them and each other in asking about the state of the mind of American Catholicism. Extensive biographies of all of our speakers can be found in your program notes, so I will be brief in my introductions. Our first speaker is Michael Buckley, University Professor of Theology at Boston College. Father Buckley is a systematic theologian whose writing has often looked at the character of the Catholic University. Thank you very much. <clears throat> On May 14, 1956, 55, some 51 years ago, the distinguished Catholic historian Monsignor John Tracy Ellis addressed the Catholic Commission on Intellectual and Cultural Affairs in a lecture which he titled, American Catholics and the Intellectual Life. Notice the vast spread of that last noun. No address by an American scholar in that century garnered so extensive an audience and elicited such divergent responses. If it is carefully analyzed, however, it can emerge as little more than an extensive argument for the paradox formulated by the distinguished English political scientist Dennis Brogan about the church in the United States. Brogan said that in no Western society is the intellectual prestige of Catholicism lower than in the country, the United States, where in such respects as wealth, numbers, and strength of organization, it is so powerful. And Monsignor Ellis commented, no well-informed American Catholic will attempt to challenge that statement. This reading of the intellectual life of the church in the United States of some 50 years ago constitutes what John Dewey would have called a problematic situation, the problematic situation within which Ellis's uh, words are framed. It, they are the chaos and the context out of which his question emerges. We do, uh, do not have time to consider each of the critically important judgments that Ellis formulated some half century ago, sorting out where the evaluation would still tell, where it should be modified, and where subsequent decades have successfully met the challenge. What seems to me propedeutic for our purpose is the affirmation that there are explanations and reasons demanded. Ellis offers some, and both all of them focus upon the American Catholics have not made a notable impression on the intellectual life of their country. Now, Ellis gives three immediate influences that conspire to occasion this, but their seeming diversity resolves into a strikingly apposite unity. The first among these reasons was the failure of the American Catholics to give attention to the subjects in which they could and should have made a unique contribution. Ellis is speaking about 
the contrast between the scholastic philosophy taught out of the manuals at Catholic universities at the same time as distinguished contributions to scholastic philosophy were forthcoming from Chicago, Virginia, Princeton, and St. John's in Annapolis. By distinguished contributions, Alice is speaking of the world of research and scholarship. The second occasion lay with the ruinous competition among the Catholic graduate schools, none of which is adequately endowed, he said, and few of which have the trained personnel, the equipment in libraries and laboratories, and the professional wage scales to warrant their ambitious undertakings. The result is a perpetuation of mediocrity. And as the third cause, he cites, the absence of a love of scholarship for its own sake American, among American Catholics, and that too, even among a large number of Catholics who are engaged in higher education. Catholic society in the United States does not nourish the massive inspiration and the commitments needed for advanced and valid scholarship. Now, as Ellis's article plays out, its argument narrows. His essay must limit itself before the massive problem it would entertain. Analyzing Catholic intellectual life, he actually says very little about education and teaching. Secondary and even collegiate education as such are virtually unnoticed except statistically. Students are hardly mentioned. Curricular integrity and disciplinary reform are ignored despite their impressive revival in the institutions in that very decade that Monsignor Ellis singles out for praise. The then current retrieval of humanism and of the liberal arts to form the students intellectually suffers a similar preterition. Monsignor Ellis speaks a great deal about research and graduate studies and advanced publications, all of which he subsumes under the rubric scholarship, and he finds it seriously defective. Terms that mean a great deal to him are embarrassingly prestige, regard, commanding influence, and so forth. And this praise is elicited for the Catholic schools from the intellectual culture of the United States only by distinguished products in research, writing, and in scholarships. The index of the intellectual life of our American Catholics in this book is calibrated principally in terms of significant scholarship. Let us look at this. We know that scholarship or research is not the same thing as education, even higher education, let alone is it the sole arena of intellectual life. University education seeks to impart the knowledge that is most worth having and to develop those habits and sensibilities, those skills or arts, if you will, in the student by which subsequent scholarship or research can be done and intellectual leadership given. But scholarship and research do not seek so much to impart knowledge as they seek to advance knowledge, more exactly to create new knowledge. Education is primarily a contribution to the student. Scholarship is primarily a contribution to knowledge itself. It bespeaks the range and extension of a field of knowledge. Now these distinctions seem to me of crucial importance if we are to analyze Ellis's article and its telling indictment of American Catholic intellectual life. I think it is fair to say that Ellis locates most of this failure, not exclusively but comprehensively, in the absence of scholarship and the ineffectuality of the Catholic universities to promote scholarship. And so I am asking this question. For all its historical and ideological limitations, does Monsignor Ellis's criticism not have a point that we would do well to recognize? For while Catholic universities have improved massively in the quality of their faculties and in the education they impart, the issue of their contribution to significant scholarship, research, academic leadership, and to the deep influences within the intellectual culture of the nation, these all remain. It seems to me that what Monsignor Ellis's piece is all about is to focus upon scholarship, indeed what he calls Catholic scholarship. I should like then, in the pages that I have, 
to do two things to attempt a viable understanding of this crucial term, Catholic scholarship, and to come secondly and to come to some understanding why it is so crucial to Catholic higher education. What is Catholic scholarship? Enormous ambiguity stalks this term, Catholic scholarship. Is there any, in any rigorous sense of the term, is there such a thing as a Catholic scholarship? It seems absurd, a category error. Are we to talk about a Catholic physics or a Presbyterian archeology? span Does scholarship itself have a religious identity? And does the phrase Catholic scholarship simply indicate serious intellectual engagement entered into by those who are Catholic? Is that it? If that is what one means, then David O'Brien has written, the problem has been resolved. He wrote, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that Catholics now are as likely as anyone to attend college and graduate school and enter intellectual careers. There is no question over the past 50 years, Catholic higher education as such has developed significantly with some of the Catholic universities numbered among the more distinguished in the nation and the life of scholarship on the rise. Granted that scholarship is not education, then does Catholic scholarship simply mean the scholarship or the research done by Catholics or by some Catholic institutions? As the question Monsignor Ellis can be phrased, where are the Catholic Salks, the Catholic Einsteins, the Catholic George Kennans, and so forth? There is obviously not a Catholic medicine, a Catholic mathematics, and a Catholic logic. And any attempt to, uh, to frame such a peculiar discipline would be met by resounding laughter. But there are Catholic reasons for undertaking a life as a researcher or a mathematician or a logician or a career in chemistry. The Catholic can somehow or other be the purpose of a life of scholarship, whether seen as a vocation to a field or a vocation to a particular institution. Is this what we mean by Catholic scholarship? Not simply the content and the agent, but the motive and the context for which and by which Catholics do scholarship. Is the Catholic and Catholic scholarship to be reduced to motivation? I think not. And this still does not reach the depth or the challenge of Monsignor's term. If we are talking seriously and precisely about Catholic scholarship, we must be talking about scholarship itself not the religious confession or ideals of its authors, not the motivation that drew them into scholarship. Catholic scholarship is to expand intrinsically the research that is done or the knowledge that is advanced by the questions and also by the data that is under reflection. It suggests an advancement of knowledge encouraged by a distinctive Catholic influence or presence or context. Now is there, can there be, a contribution to knowledge that bears a specific mark of the Catholic intellectual? And precisely in this way, makes a unique contribution to this kind of knowledge, to the character of the church and the university, and to the society of science and letters. What could this possibly be? I think the characteristic that one would look for is some sort of disciplined and reflective community or conjunction or intersection, call it what you will, among all, any and all of the forms of human culture and Catholic faith. Is this coming through? Can you hear me okay? Okay. <clears throat> Let me try that sentence again. I think the characteristics that one would look for in this sort of disciplined and reflective community or conjunction or intersection, call it what you will, among any and all of the forms of human culture on one side and Catholic faith on the other. Whether you're calling that product of the intersection a habit of mind or procedures of scientific and humanistic inquiry or formal education or the informal commitment to a just social order. Catholic scholarship is not simply a single discipline or an enterprise. It is an interrelation of the disciplines as they admit of questions of ultimate importance. For fundamentally, the Catholic believes that just as nature finds its completion in grace, so all the forms of human culture, all of them, 
can find their, their encouragement, their fulfillment, indeed their enhancement in the hopes and vision of a humanity given in faith. The labor, the sensitivities, the comprehensive inclusion of all that is human under the influence and presence of him for whom, as Ephesians said, all things were created. These are the marks of a scholarship that calls itself Catholic. All of the disciplines and arts were to bring this conjunction about and to open expectantly to a deeper level of understanding and engagement. This also should mark a scholarship that can be called Catholic. How does such an intersection, a union, take place? In myriad ways. Scholarship can be Catholic because of the question or the problem that it discloses within human life and because of the cosmic realities that cry out for further reflection and exploration. Scholarship can be Catholic because the presupposition about human life with God in this world that is the sacramental vision and sensibility of Catholics. Catholic scholarship is more than simply scholarship done by Catholics. It is more focused sense, the sense that I am using it now. It is that advancement of knowledge that takes up issues raised by the intersection of human culture and faith and that embody presuppositions about God's action in the world and God's self-disclosure as found in Christ, about what it means to be a human being, about what meaning and resources human society and culture possess. Because for the Catholic, if you want to know what it means to be a human be being, ultimately you look at Christ. And if you want to know what it means to be God, ultimately you look at Christ. As one comes to a disciplined awareness and understanding and assimilation of this, she comes into her Catholic education. As she labors in, in advance, in, to advance the reaches of this knowledge and the reaches of this knowledge and the understanding as is the common patrimony of the civilized world, she contributes to Catholic scholarship. It is a single vision, ideally. It is a unified vision. Perhaps a very small example in all this abstraction. We learn something about the meaning of human life and death from war and peace, or from the Iliad, or from Sigurd Unset. We see something of the great stretches of its promise and beauty, the pathos of its young loves and misunderstandings, the sorrow of its partings and betrayals. We learn about human beings through these works. But we also learn cumulatively simply about human life and death from research in human anatomy and physiology, in human genetics and neurophysiology. We see something of ourselves in the self-replication of DNA and in the evolution of the species through natural selection. We also learn something about ourselves, about human life and death, from scholarship and political science and economics, from the historical study of the interaction of the nation states, the massive motivational and technical issues engaged by war and peace, the relationships between East interest rates and inflation, the free market economy and globalization, welfare, and the possibilities of a humane life for the poor. But as one comes to appreciate and to love human life and the thousand disciplines and questions by which and through which it is exhibited, one can feel profoundly troubled by its annihilation, by the death of those we love, of our own approaching death. As we study human life in all its multiple disciplines, the question naturally arises from within us about death, about the meaning of life as it faces death. Now you can handle the question about death in many ways in a university. You can say that this question has no empirical meaning and is out of place in a world of serious scholarship. Go see your pastor. Or you can say that it is obviously a very important question, but it cannot be handled by the university disciplines. It may well be that you have examined the history of the extermination of the Jews and the Native Americans and the Irish, that you have done some study of the physics of the subatomic, with all its suggestion of contrived purpose, that you have gotten some deeper appreciation of the perdurance of beauty and the meaning of art and music. Every discipline, every human, human, human enterprise will ultimately raise the question that transcends it. 
What is the university to do about that kind of question? Or thirdly, you can say that it is a very serious question, that it cannot be handled by individual courses or even by the academic culture that raised it. But there are serious discipline patterns of inquiry, such as philosophy and theology, that take up precisely these questions that arise in other disciplines and taking those disciplines as its starting point. What Catholic Reflection does is it mingles the disciplines. It explores the true meaning of life through a reflection upon the reality of Christ that we call theological. But the question comes to it from many other disciplines in the university. As Catholic scholarship is extensive and coherent in its presence and influence, it brings that human promise and beauty, the pathos and sorrows, the intricate structures and biological drives, the massive disagreements and debates about political interactions and economic forces. It brings them to a determinate set of equally disciplined studies that integrate what it means to hear the great promise of the gospel. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. What are the issues or problems that are what the presuppositions that go with this kind of Catholic reflection? Whether and out of what disciplines the ultimates in human existence and the meaning of what it is to be a human being are advanced or implicitly understood. There is both reason and need for the contribution we are calling Catholic scholarship. For we are insisting that Catholic scholarship occurs when some scholarly depth, in some scholarly depth, when there is either one of two things, the illumination of human culture by faith or the inculturation of faith so that it lives within a particular culture. Now, I want to make one more point. I want to argue that the unity between scholarship and um, scholarship and religious reflection is much deeper than what I've just said. I want to argue that any human movement towards meaning or coherence or truth, whether in the humanities or in the sciences, whether in the arts or the professions, I want to argue that any of those is inchoatively, potentially religious. This provocative statement obviously does not mean that quantum mechanics or dancing or exploration is religion or theology. But it does mean that the intellectual dynamism inherent in all human inquiry initiates a process or habits of questioning that, if not inhibited, inevitably bear upon the ultimate questions that engage religion. Why? Because any inquiry moves to the satisfaction of questions. Any satisfaction of questions sets in motion further questions. And these in their turn open up to further inquiry. Questioning keeps going on because the drive to know is not satisfied, it's not complete, there's more that we don't know. The human intellect moves asymptotically towards the satisfaction of inquiry in this completion, but it doesn't possess it. One keeps asking questions unless this natural drive is repressed as a very important condition. Until they lead to the question about ultimate explanation or intelligibility, about the truth of the finite itself, which all human beings call God. This is very much, as a matter of fact, the... Uh, the kind of movement that you find in people like uh, Aristotle or Lonigan. The relentless inquiry constitutes the natural career of the scholarly mind, unless it is dogmatically secularized and it arrest in, or arrested in its progress by dictating a despair of its fulfillment. Similarly, the commitments and instincts of faith are inescapably towards their realization within human culture. This again and obviously does not suggest that all serious faith is scholarship, but it does mean that the dynamism inherent in the experience of faith, if not inhibited by fetaism, is towards the concrete, towards the incarnation, in every other dimension of human life. Faith moves towards its own realization and expression in a thousand ways in which the human culture exists. The explanation, the experience of faith becomes the source of questions that naturally leads into the sciences and the arts. 
The questions bear upon the meaning and truth, the commitment of faith, and the relationship so universal a stance towards everything else that falls within human experience. Consequently, if allowed their full development, and that's what the Catholic University must do, and what should be enshrined in, the, in Catholic scholarship, if allowed their full development, the religiously intrinsically will engage human culture, and human culture will intrinsically engage the religious. And Catholic scholarship is the steady and painstaking study and disclosure of some of their mutual engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Our spe second speaker is Eugene McCarraher, Assistant Professor of Humanities at Villanova University. Dr. McCarraher is interested in the intersection between religion, culture, and economics. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say something in the spirit of Chesterton. Um, who once expressed his desire to sing both the Magnificat and the Marseillaise. Um, tomorrow uh, is, signifies two great days, and I want to take this opportunity to wish you both a, Saint, uh, a happy St. Joseph the Worker Day and a happy May Day. I always tell my students that, yes, dates are important. Uh, and so I'll begin by recalling that John Tracy Ellis published his essay in book form in 1956. Now, 1956 was a banner year in American cultural criticism, marked by the appearance of two works which will provide something of a frame for my remarks. The first is William H. White's The Organization Man, and the second is Allen Ginsberg's Howell. White's book is often classified, uh, as you probably know, among the 50s assaults on this thing called conformity, uh, and his Organization Man is counted among these other fiends in this gray flannel demonology of post-war cultural commentary. You know, you've got your one-dimensional man, you have your uh, other directed character, your status seeker, etc. cetera, ad infinitum. But it's important to remember that White, who was an editor at Fortune, it's worth recalling, uh, stated very clearly that his book was, quote, not a plea for nonconformity. The organization, capital O, uh, or the business corporation, to be less euphemistic about it, was here to stay in White's view. And its org men and their families possessed ample opportunity, so he thought, for material and personal fulfillment. Quote, none has been so well equipped to lead a meaningful community life. Now, Ginsburg, of course, impolitely disagreed. White's organization man was Ginsburg's Moloch, quote, whose mind is pure machinery, whose blood is running money, whose soul is electricity and banks. Now, while countless laborers, quote, broke their backs lifting Moloch to heaven, they toiled in delusion, as far as Ginsburg was concerned, since they were, quote, lifting the city to heaven which exists and is everywhere around us. I think that situating Ellis in relation to a business journalist and a poet will illuminate the significance of his essay and suggest the line of critique we need to pursue. Ellis' essay, first of all, reflects a conjuncture of historical moments. The entrance of large numbers of American Catholics into the professional and managerial classes after the Second World War. The desire of Catholic intellectuals to join the growing ranks of the academic intelligentsia in the expanding university system. The enlistment of Catholics in Cold War nationalism. And the accommodation of Catholicism to the political and moral economies of corporate capitalism. Now, for all its indisputable and hopefully imperishable diagnosis of Catholic intellectual mediocrity, Ellis essay was, like White's book, a plea for a sort of fitful conformity to the intellectual culture of the American century. At a time, however, like ours, when American hegemony may well be in the initial stages of senescence, and when the intellectual purpose of the contemporary university often seems both illegible and mercenary, I think we need a new sort of reckoning with American intellectual life, from the vantage of a Catholic humanism which poses a criticism with unlikely similarity to Ginsburg's. Now, the object of Ellis' concern was, of course, the ethos and curricula of Catholic higher education, or what John Dewey 
in this exquisitely Dewey and way called a problematic situation. This simply confirms, um, when Father Buckley mentioned this, confirms Lewis Mumford's judgment of Dewey's prose, which is like a bad subway ride. You get to your destination, but you're a little the worse for wear. Structured by neo-scholastic philosophy, leavened by piety and hedged by the modernist controversies of the early 20th century, Catholic colleges and universities aspired not to extend the frontiers of knowledge, but to fortify the boundaries of the faith in a Protestant and suspicious, if not hostile, nation. But not all Catholic intellectuals were satisfied with simply defending the one true church. Bishop John Ireland had anticipated Ellis in the 1890s when he urged the Notre Dame audience on to, quote, deeper researches, more extensive surveyings. Quote, let us be the most erudite historians, the most experienced scientists, the most acute philosophers. Catholics, Ireland concluded, must lead, quote, wherever intelligence is at work. And Ireland identified scientific inquiry, the management of large enterprises, and statesmanship as the prime venues of apostolic modernity. But Ireland peaked too soon. And as of the mid-1950s, many Catholic university students could well have said, as Michael Novak remembered of his college days, that their instructors had, quote, some of the finest minds of the 15th century. <laughs> the prevailing model of Catholic university leadership was, as one wit put it in 1949, quote, a cross between a bishop, a Rotarian, and a fullback. Now that word Rotarian pointed to the proprietary imagination of American capitalism an imagination increasingly out of sync with the corporate reconstruction of the economy over the 20th century. The corporate business model, in fact, structures Ellis' account of American Catholicism and its intellectual life. The American church, he noted, had become, quote, big business in the typically American meaning of that term. That's Ellis, not me. Indeed, Ellis clearly stated that the occasion for his essay was what he considered, quote, the happy augury of business leaders' interest in higher education. Ellis warned that Catholic institutions weren't, wouldn't meet their standards. The church's intellectual personnel were failing to produce national leaders, were to, quote, exercise commanding influence in intellectual circles. They, weren't, they were even underrepresented in who's who, for God's sake. Ellis rounded up the usual suspects, a ghetto mentality, the lack of industry and habits of work among Catholic students and teachers, and then urged Catholic educators to emulate secular institutions and their exemplary features of high academic standards, developments of, development of habits of work and research. Now there's no doubt that Catholic higher education in 1956 was no republic of letters. And it would be silly to deny that the quality of scholarship at Catholic universities has risen in the last half century. Indeed, at many, if not most, Catholic institutions, faculty and students engage with, even possess, some of the finest minds of the 21st century. Engaging with the A-list of modernity and post-modernity is a lineal descendant of Augustine's struggles with Virgil, or Aquinas wrestling with Averroes. But I'm not going to belabor the narrative of progress, as I wonder if we need to ask a new set of historical and critical questions. Were non-Catholic institutions a republic of letters, pulsing with a vibrant and fearless intellectual life? Ellis assumed that they were, but there's ample historical evidence to think otherwise. Thanks to McCarthyism, elite universities were, as Ellen Schrecker once put it, no ivory tower. Let's also recall that the Harvard-Yale axis would soon be giving us national leaders with commanding influence in the persons of Robert McNamara, McGeorge Bundy, and others in the illustrious pantheon of wunderkind war criminals, smothering the Vietnamese people with napalm and modernization. Moreover, as Ellis was writing, the American university system was in the first stages of its full integration into the corporate military order, or perhaps better, in the final stages of the well-mannered atrophy that Alistair McIntyre described as the fate of the liberal Enlightenment university. Those, out there, those of you out there who think that the contemporary university looks, sounds, and educates like a corporation, or brand you, as it was satirized in the New York Times last Wednesday, 
should know that this was precisely the ideal of James Conan, Clark Kerr, and other administrative visionaries committed to making the academy into the technical, scientific, and cultural hub of the American century. Ellis was arguing, in effect, for the incorporation of Catholic intellectual life into the matrix of organization that White viewed with such ambivalence. By affirming habits of work and research, Ellis promoted, and Catholic institutions have increasingly adopted, the quantitative industrial regimen of scholarship, which, I would maintain, has done a lot to blight our academic culture. How many articles have been ground out like link sausages to feed the maws of scholarly associations? How many trees have been felled to fuel how many races for tenure and promotion? This comparison of the uh, current academic career uh, to a climb in the business corporation can be overworked, but it remains just as apt. But there are, there's, a quanti I think, a qualitative criticism to be made here as well. Have Catholic scholars brought their faith to bear on the conceptual architecture of their disciplines, which would be the most significant contribution they could make? Here I have to say that I'm, not, I'm unsatisfied by Father Buckley's restriction of the, relevance of, Catholic, of the relevance of Catholicism to the consideration of something called meaning. More provocative and fruitful, however, is his assertion that Catholic scholarship is marked by, quote, the questions or problems it researches. Certainly that should be true in the humanities. Speaking from the field of history, my problem with much of the history written by Catholic historians over the last 50 years is not so much with the answers obtained with a remarkable degree of labor and sophistication, but with the questions they ask, few if any of which stray from the recognized inquisitive protocols of the discipline. Now, Ellis wasn't alone in his call for emulation, as he was joined by other Catholic intellectuals such as Walter Ong, Thomas O'Dee, and John Courtney Murray. All these intellectuals wanted to produce those national leaders with commanding influence in intellectual circles. Ong picked up the baton from Ellis in 1957 when he asserted that educational reform was necessary both to widen the laity's business and social contacts and to extend what he called the apostolate to the business world. O.D. announced that, quote, capitalism, democracy, science, and faith in the common man had created a social order in the United States that conformed, quote, to the standards of Christian humanism. Thus, O.D. concluded, educated Catholics had a tripart obligation, quote, to God, to the church, and to the republic. Catholics could be critics, O.D. conceded, but only on condition that they were first collaborators. This is the responsible critic gambit, a polite way of asking dissenters to, suck a, to stuck a so, so, blah, 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 stuff a sock in their mouths. Murray built, perhaps, the sturdiest bridge between Catholic intellectuals and the post-war power elite. And we hold these truths. Murray upheld the cultural authority of the organization man. Quote, the conclusions of careful university presidents, the reasoned opinions of specialists, the statements of responsible journalists, the solid pronouncements of respected politicians. All these composed for Murray, quote, the real tribunal, tribunal, to which the American system is finally accountable. Careful, reasoned, responsible, solid. Such is the palaver of power. In Murray, Christ meets Polonius. So what about our current state of Catholic national leaders with influence, commanding or otherwise, in the nation's intellectual life? Now, as much as we accentuate the differences between conservative and liberal Catholics on this score, I would contend that both are direct descendants of Ellis Cold War cultural politics. Take the neocons, for instance, exemplified by Novak, George Weigel, Father Richard Newhouse, you know the usual suspects at First Things. Now, First Things, I have to say, has often supplied a refreshing antidote to theological pablum. By insisting on fidelity to tradition and not to fashion, First Things was, and even continues to be, a pocket of resistance to the dictatorship of relativism. Alas, I wish the brethren at First Things would better heed McIntyre about the threats to tradition from capitalism and the nation state. On economic matters, the neocons have been reliably pro-corporate. 
from Novak and his theology of the corporation to Father Robert Sirico and the Acton Institute putting this penumbra of holiness around the amoral elegance of neoclassical economics. For neocons, God and mammon have composed their differences and formed a lucrative partnership. Meanwhile, their civil religious piety is complicit with the Caesaro evangelicalism that defines the Protestant right. There, God and Caesar share a chariot in the triumphal procession toward global liberal democracy. In short, the neocons have joined the roster of the careful and responsible, the embedded intellectuals of Wall Street and the Beltway who define the boundaries of something called realism. Now, if you expect a rousing alternative to Newhouse and company from liberal Catholics, don't hold your breath. While I still believe that this lineage bears enormous promise as a site for Catholic engagement with American life, liberal Catholicism, frankly, seems to me in a state of exhaustion, drift, and even intellectual coma. Gary Will's trajectory is a brilliant but cautionary tale here. He began as a paleocon Catholic with William F. Buckley in the National Review, and then was radicalized by the civil rights and the anti-war movements. And he brought this newly emancipated Catholicism to bear on two of, really, two of the most remarkable books of the 1960s, which I would urge you to all go out and buy at fine books, used bookstores near you. Uh, Nixon Agonistes and uh, Bear Ruin Choirs. Since then, alas, Wills, like so many other liberal Catholics, has settled into a smarmy and unimaginative centrism, whose fatigue is evident in What Jesus Meant, his last book. What Jesus Meant is a lame and tired volume, hardly the kind of book that would have inspired Martin Luther King or Daniel Berrigan to lay down their lives for anything. So if Ellis were around to add a postscript, what would I advise him to say? What is the new assignment for American Catholics in the intellectual life, and on what resources can they draw? Well, if Ellis wasn't shy about naming his occasion, neither will I. Uh, I would advise him to ponder those lines from Ginsburg about Moloch, and urge Catholic intellectuals to remind all of us that Christian faith is reckless and foolish by the standards of Thomas Friedman and David Brooks. In the university, Catholic intellectuals have to, ins have to resist the increasingly unabashed hegemony of corporate business and the pecuniary ethos that now corrupts university culture. These two influences, I would maintain to you, are far more corrosive of Catholic university life than some vague thing called liberalism. Now more than ever, the American university as a whole is in thrall to that mind of pure machinery of which Ginsburg uh, was fearful. The mission of Catholic universities today is not to emulate, but to educate non-Catholic and, and especially secular institutions in the integration of teaching and research around a compelling vision of the human person, that imago dei so enormously threatened by the nihilism of pseudo-virtues like productivity and practicality, and the degradation of labor that's an imperative of corporate enterprise. Thus, in and out of the university, Catholic intellectuals should challenge this canon law and theodicy that goes by the name of economics and the civil religion of American nationalism. I think it will be a fine day, folks, when Christian Catholics and other Christians are once again accused of atheism. If Ellis wrote at the apex of the American century, we, I wager, folks, will be witnesses to the climacteric of its demise. And Catholic intellectuals are excellently positioned to help their fellow citizens negotiate that downward slope. They have at their disposal a motley array of intellectual currents, stretching back to the 1930s, that I would characterize as a radical Catholic humanism. And I'll mention three of them. First is the, uh, what's called this radical orthodoxy associated with John Milbank. The second is the ressourcement, exemplified best by Henri de Lubac and the social thought of the Catholic worker movement. As disparate and sometimes conflicting as they are, they all share the conviction expressed by Father Buckley that, quote, as nature finds its completion in grace, so all the forms of human culture can find a fulfillment and enhancement in the hope and vision of humanity given in faith. Against the, shibboleth, the shibboleths of avarice and nation, 
and the exotic pedantry of postmodernism, both of which in the end are just the latest fashions in what Augustine called libido dominandi, or the love of domination. This Catholic humanism sets the standard of fidelity to the Beatitudes. And that suggests that love should be the animating principle of the intellectual life, not productivity or even commanding influence. Now, it's often called the hermeneutic of suspicion, that form of knowledge which, by holding its objects at a distance, makes a ruthless alienation the defining condition of the intellect. This hermeneutic of suspicion adds immeasurably to our trove of knowledge, and it supplies an indispensable weapon against all forms of cant and obscurantism and injustice. But the exorbitant uh, cost of its authority, I think, is evident all around us. And I think it's time to consider, along with, August, with the Augustine of, on Christian doctrine, we should start considering caritas as the vital virtue of the, intel, of the mind. A habit of intellect which, quote, searches for lessons useful to the building of charity. Such a mind is discerning and capacious enough to separate the wheat from the chaff in the promises of our time. And it is generous and imaginative enough to enlarge our horizon of political possibility. Hapless and sentimental as it might sound, the Catholic intellectuals of this generation might find that their true vocation is to rescue love from the hallowed oblivion of idealism, always a word to be careful of, and restore it to the center of our intellectual culture and even to our nation's moral and political vocabulary. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Our third speaker is M. Kathleen Caveney, the John P. Murphy Foundation Professor of Law and Professor of Theology at the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Caveney's research and teaching explore the relationships among philosophy, theology, and the law. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank Boston College for uh, inviting me to participate in such a wonderful uh, afternoon event on such a beautiful spring day in the area in which I used to live. Um, it's nice to be back in New England. Reading through the Ellis piece, it struck me how much of the problem that he identified concerned the place of intellectuals in American life. Intellectuals have a problem, it seems, in this country. We get no respect, to quote Rodney Dangerfield. As Ellis said it, the situation of the intellectual in the United States has been and is at the present time deplorable. For Ellis, the odds of a flourishing intellectual life among American Catholics are slim. First and foremost, because they're Americans. And second, and only second, because the peculiar situation of the Catholic Church in America leaves them unable to access the riches of their intellectual heritage to combat the anti-intellectualism all around them. And we've heard about why, the challenges of educating an immigrant church, the prejudice against Catholics, which led to a ghetto mentality in response, and third, the educational level of lay uh, people and clerics left them devoid of a particular intellectual heritage from Europe or where they were coming from that would allow them to interject something new and rigorously intellectual into the American culture. So the problem for him first is the problem of America and intellectual life. So what I'd like to do in this little talk is first talk about the state of intellectual life in the United States in general today with reference to the particular elements of Ellis's assessment of it. And then second, talk about the resources that the Catholic tradition has today, especially the resources of young Catholics to interact with the broader currents of intellectual life in America. And then finally, and very briefly, to come up with a few suggestions about how we might 
try to bring intellectual life and Catholic tradition into, a, in, into some position to aid and enhance intellectual life in America in general. So the state of life of intellectuals in the United States. First question we have to ask, as Father Buckley noted, is what do we mean by intellectual life? He distinguished between higher education, which after all is the teaching and forming of all people, all young people, including future intellectuals, and academic scholarship. And academic scholarship was the focus of Father Buckley's talk. And just to remind you of what he said, let me quote, scholarship seeks to advance knowledge, more exactly to create new knowledge. Education is primarily a contribution to the student. Scholarship is primarily a contribution to knowledge itself. It is the range or extension of a field of knowledge. The locus of scholarship is the university primarily, and Father Buckley's prescription really focuses on what we need in universities. The most important step, he tells us, is the concentration on serious and distinguished scholarship, the hard work of pushing back the frontiers of knowledge. But there's another meaning to the term intellectual that's come up today. And I think it was more the focus of Professor McCarraher's talk. And that's the life of the public intellectual. What are public intellectuals? Well, they are people, I think, who draw upon wide-ranging intellectual resources to interpret our current situation to an educated public. In the current era, you might say that the public intellectuals that he mentioned include Michael Novak, Richard John Newhouse, and the First Things crowd, or if you're on the other side of the liberal conservative spectrum, maybe the Commonweal crowd. <coughs> Professor McCarraher's prescription, and I quote, in and out of the university, Catholic intellectuals must blaspheme the totem of the market state, the canon law, and the theodicy that goes by the name of economics, and the civil religion of American nationalism. As that quote suggests, the location of the public intellectual isn't just the university. It also occurs in popular journals like uh, First Things in Commonweal, in think tanks, and increasingly on web blogs or blogs for all of you that have internet connections. Now I think there's a tremendous amount of tension among the requirements of these three categories. Father Buckley talked a little bit about the tension between education and scholarship. I'd like to explore a little bit, or I think at least, the real tension that we need to think about today is between being a scholar and between being a public intellectual. Now, there's some overlap in the vocations, and there's some competition in general, but I think it's worse in our current climate than it need be. Why? Well, I'm going to suggest that public intellectual in our context is understood in a way that accommodates the features of American life that distrust intellectuals and those features as Ellis identifies them. That's one problem. And the second problem is I think there's a shift in direction. I think public intellectual, as it's understood in this American context, is becoming the central meaning of the term intellectual and it's seeping into the scholarly realm and affecting our understanding of what counts as a scholar. And in fact, if you read the Ellis essay carefully, you see some equivocation on these points. On the one hand, he wants scholarship for its own sake. He wants us to delve deeply into the requirements of the fields of knowledge. On the other hand, he wants us to be effective and important and to have a voice in the public square in order to maintain and, uh, the democracy as we know it. So what is it? Which is it? We've got to figure that out. But to figure that out, we have to figure out a little bit what the problems are with intellectual life in the United States. Well, according to Ellis, 50 years ago, we had four of them. First, we didn't have a love of reading. 
in our culture. Very few families were teaching their children to love reading and the knowledge that you could get by wide reading. Secondly, I'll talk about the problem of democratic leveling. Ellis quotes Tocqueville. In the United States, they do not fear distinguished talents, but are rarely fond of them. In general, everyone who rises without the aid of the public seldom obtains their favor. People, the population, like to make the people they admire. They like to make their leaders. They like to assess their leaders. And later, they like to demote their leaders. Third, we have an attachment to material goods rather than goods of the spirit or goods of the mind. And fourth, and I think this permeates the other three, we're practical. Americans are practical. We want results. We don't want eggheads spinning ideas that are useless off in ivory towers. These are the four features of American life that make it hard for intellectuals in general, according to Ellis. Have they changed? Well, what about love of reading? Not so much, I think. We watch a lot of television, we watch a lot of music vid videos, and we absorb information increasingly in a different way on the World Wide Web, on the Internet. I think there's going to have to be a lot of work going into how this both, en both enhances our ability to absorb knowledge, but also impedes a certain type of long-term patient and disciplined reflection. Democratic leveling. In other words, we think that something is valuable or good because it pleases us. We hold our standards constant and evaluate. We don't allow people to change or to suggest what might be improved in our standards. I have two words for this. American Idol. We make good musicians. Good musicians don't teach us what counts as good music. So that hasn't helped any. Attachment to material goods, if anything, I think it's more extreme, in part because of the financial precariousness that many people feel themselves in in the current day. And finally, practicality. Again, it's still a dominant concern. I don't think it's any accident that one of the most popular majors of undergraduates at Notre Dame is business. Law and medicine are good professions. You can make a good living. You can provide for your family. You can be respected. It's practical. It's not practical to major in religious studies, as, as I did, you know, or in philosophy, or even in English. And so actually what happens is pre-law advisors come along and tell parents how, don't worry, your religious studies major can go to law school, can go to medical school, can go on and earn a good life, even if they do major in something so impractical as philosophy or theology. Do you end up with out an account of an intellectual life if you're an American, if you're permeated by these four factors that Ellis identified? No, I don't think so. You end up with an account of the intellectual life that's shaped by these four criteria. In fact, what I'd like to suggest is you end up with an instrumental account of the intellect as the dominant notion. Our minds on this vision are tools. We use them to get what we want. They are not us. They are not essential parts of us that are intrinsically rather than instrumentally valuable. They are not, as Aquinas would have it, a point of contact with the divine, with God. Furthermore, in most cases, unfortunately, our minds are not to be used on this instrumental account to engage in the patient dialectical process Father Buckley identified by which we probe, refine, and redefine what we want in order to transform what we want by virtue of our care careful patient inquiry. We want what we want, period, and we go ahead and figure out a way to get it, period. So Ellis's, three, um, Ellis's four problems about the 
uh, intellectual life in the United States and this instrumental conception of the intellect in my view are mutually reinforcing they fit together no reading how do we deal with that well you get the resources you need to make your argument in the most efficient way possible you forage for materials that support your argument that support what you want to do and the internet in fact is actually the perfect vehicle for obtaining information for the instrumental mind you google you get your result you put it in it's over in an instant democratic leveling well again your idea of what you want your taste is shaped by other grounds including the influence of your peers you use your mind in order to figure out how to please the people who are going to be your judges the population around you your audience your students in the case of TCEs teacher course evaluations you've got your audience you perform they judge you you tailor your performance to their judgment materialism you use your intellect to make money or to get results that allow you to, to defend and preserve the way you want to live as you see it and practicality well there's nothing more practical in a narrow sense of practical not in an Aristotelian sense of practical of using your mind as a tool the most powerful tool you've got I think that this way of thinking about thinking this way of thinking about how we relate to our minds actually resonates a lot with legal advocacy with legal thinking with the way lawyers especially litigators approach what it is that they're doing and I think if you look around and in, in terms of with that paradigm in mind you can account for an awful lot of of what we see about intellectual life what do lawyers do think about it for a second in a trial you've got you know a plaintiff and a defendant your lawyer represents you your lawyer represents your side your lawyers job is to turn his or her mind into an instrument that will allow you to get what you want in the context of the legal system well you've really only got a couple of clearly defined options right you're either innocent you're guilty you're liable or you're not liable transferred over into the public realm you can see this kind of instrumental reasoning you're either arguing on behalf of the Democrats or you're arguing on behalf of the Republicans you're with the ACLU or you're with focus on the family you know on this litigator model what you stand for what you want to achieve ahead of time you know who your opponents are too and you marshal the arguments that will get the result that's favored by your side you answer objections raised to your arguments by advocates of the position of the other position you're in a debate in essence not a discussion what do I mean to get at by this distinction well the worst thing you can do if you're in a debate or if you're litigating a case is to reframe the question the question is already framed you've got to hold that question constant and argue on behalf of your side you can't say yes but and loyalty in this context is more important than truth any qualification any wavering from your position is viewed as betrayal a defense lawyer can't say you know I think you're right my client might bear some responsibility for what happened but probably not as much as you think maybe we could talk about it that doesn't go over very well in terms of professional ethics on this model of reasoning at least once you get to the litigation stage you don't express your worries about your position in public you only do it in private among your friends among people who are going to shore up what you think and this of course is utterly opposed to the intellectual life as professor McCarraher and father Buckley have described it where the whole point of what we're doing is to ask questions to change our mind to reframe questions as professor McCarraher pointed out 
in light of a sense that the prior questions aren't useful, aren't helpful, aren't true. You end up in a world where there's segmentation that rather than collaboration. If you've got a litigator's view of the world, we're not all involved in a common project. Some of us work for the defense, some of us work for the prosecution. You stick with your own and then you come out to fight. Where do we see this model in our intellectual life? I suggest we see it all around us. Television pundits, take your pick, Al Franken or Bill O'Reilly. In think tanks, think tanks are organized not by disciplined pursuit of inquiry, but by commitment to the positions that underlie the founding of the think tank. Michael Novak would be in deep trouble at the American Enterprise Institute if he suddenly adopted a liberation theologian's understanding of the preferential option for the poor. Nobody would talk to him at the holiday party. Even in blog life, these web blogs out there, it increasingly seems to me that there are liberal blogs and conservative blogs, and you find your blog, your intellectual enclave, and you stick with it. And if you're feeling brave, every once in a while you might post something on another blog from another point of view, but then you would retreat back into your own blog where you could be safe and affirmed. As I described above, this instrumental understanding of the intellect unfortunately dominates our understanding of the spheres of the public intellectual. Increasingly, I think, it's seeping into our understanding of academic life. Prominence among academics, unfortunately, sometimes is understood as prominence as public intellectuals. How many conferences do you get invited to? How many times have you been on CNN? I used to say that I sometimes thought that the objective of every young academic was to get to say, well, Ted, on Nightline to Ted Koppel. Now he's not on Nightline anymore, so. Emphasis on quality and standards of production often encourages, as Professor McCarrer said, an assembly line attitude towards scholarship. If you're on tenure track, there's no room for risk. There's no room that things might not work out. There's no room to engage in a project and learn that you were wrong and to learn why you were wrong and how that being wrong contributed to the growth of knowledge. Emphasis on respect in the field, as Ellis talks about, is a two-edged sword. It encourages competence, but it can just as easily encourage people to go along to get along. So that's the American intellectual life, the challenges that it's posed, I think, to the life of scholarship. They're just as present, although they have different sources in our day as they were in Father Monsignor Ellis's day. And I think the task of intellectuals is to combat the instrumentalization of the intellect, not feed it. By emphasizing how knowledge changes a person, how becoming wiser, becoming more fully um, integrated in the, the world as it is actually changes who you are in a way that, that's for the better. Emphasis as well on the complexity of knowledge or the appropriate responses to real world situations, not binary answers that you can fit on a television talk show. An emphasis on the fundamental commonality of our pursuit of truth rather than our, on our disagreements. Emphasis on how changing one's mind in light of new information doesn't make one disloyal, it makes one fundamentally loyal to the truth. And finally, emphasis on the intrinsic worth of the pursuit of knowledge. And I think it's appropriate in Boston to quote John Adams. I must study politics and war that our sons, I'm sure he meant daughters too, may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. 
Our sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. There's an intrinsic value to knowledge, not just an instrumental one. So that's the problem with American intellectual life. How do we Catholics fit into it? Well, I agree with Father Buckley that, and I quote him here because he said it better than I can paraphrase him, wherever and in whatever disciplines the ultimate in human existence and the meaning of what it is to be a human being are advanced or implicitly understood, there is both reason and need for the contribution we are calling Catholic scholarship. Catholic scholarship occurs when at some scholarly depth there is either illumination of human culture by faith or the inculturation of faith so that it lives within a particular human culture. That's a wonderful goal and a wonderful ideal. Unfortunately, well, we wouldn't be having this colloquium today if there weren't problems with it. But the problems are different now, I think, than when, when Monsignor Ellis wrote. I want to focus on some of the problems in the appropriation of, of, of the intellectual tradition of Catholicism that's come about after the Second Vatican Council. Obviously, Monsignor Ellis was writing before it. And I want to talk about the generation raised in the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council. And I'm at the early end of that cohort. I don't remember the, um, the pre-Vatican II days or the Vatican II period. Um, fully in life, love, and joy. And that was the CCD book I learned from. <laughs> and that's a hint. In the immediate euphoria after the Second Vatican Council, there was a great emphasis of, 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 of catechists and of, of the people that were handing down the faith to make sure that their children didn't suffer from the desiccated legalism that had plagued and held them in and into a kind of a trapped and unfree appreciation of the tradition. But the trouble, and they communicated to us, and I want to say this very clearly because I'm not entirely trashing the Vatican II education, the most important fact about God, that God loves us and God calls us to love one another. But what they didn't communicate to us was everything that was in their head about the whole history of the tradition of Catholic thought, both the intellectual tradition, the piety, the practices that go along with the tradition. So what you end up with is a whole generation of people, young people, people younger than I am, who were raised in a way with an emphasis on emotion rather than content in their Catholic catechesis. And at the same time, the church seemed very, very fragile to them. Everything was changing. People were leaving the priesthood and the, and, and, and the, and the convent. Uh, people were leaving the church. Everything was just not clear. And at the same time, with the not clarity of the church, there was also the not clarity of the culture. The culture was chaotic. Everything seemed permitted. What way were you supposed to live? So the church seemed like, to many of these people, and I'm making gross generalizations here, obviously, but maybe there's a point to them, a bulwark over against the chaos, but a fragile one that needed to be shorn up. And I think the so-called John Paul II Catholics, the people who grew of age in the, in the era of the, the late Pope John Paul II, have that as their context. On the one hand, they've got a tremendous emotional commitment to the church, and they deeply and sorely need the intellectual content that it can give them. Unfortunately, however, they're putting this in the context of the culture's broader instrumental understanding of truth and knowledge. They see themselves as defending the truth as lawyers for the Pope, as marshalling arguments that they've taken from the Catechism and from John Paul II's encyclicals over and against 
the, the excesses and the, and the difficulties of the culture. The world is hanging by a thread. They're going to defend it. Now this leads naturally to a culture war mentality. If you see the world as very chaotic and you see the church as somehow a fragile defense against total chaos, you're going to see yourself in a life and death fight. And so you're going to find a lot of appropriation of the culture of life versus culture of death language from Pope John Paul II's evangelical, Evangelium Vitae encyclical, the Gospel of Life. Now, if you read that encyclical carefully, you're going to find that John Paul II meant a very sophisticated and nuanced understanding of what he meant by culture and the place of morality and culture. He wasn't, in fact, defending a dualistic approach to the world. Unfortunately, what you end up with by a lot of people that read John Paul II but haven't read all the stuff that comes before him is this sort of dualism. The church is the culture of life, the world's the culture of death. And those feed into the binary categories of the instrumentalized mind, the legalized mind that I described before. You can see how Ellis's criteria fit here as well. No reading. For many in this generation, John Paul II's thought is seen as norming the tradition, not normed by it. Democratic leveling, while there are some very good Catholic blogs, there's an author of a Catholic blog over there that I like to read quite a lot, uh, Jesuit Mark Massa, some of them need to be appropriated with a little bit of a hermeneutic of suspicion. The test of what a blog says is whether or not you agree with the blog. Blogs are in essence popularity contests run by the blog runners. Materialism. Well, blogs and this whole world are selling a total worldview, a total bubble, a total way of approaching your life. And practicality. We've seen how all this uses and is used by the political room, or realm. We've become one more powerful political interest group. We use our minds to advance the interests of our interest group, which we believe just happens to be God's interests. So what's the way forward? Well, I think we need to recover a non-instrumental conception of the intellect in the church as well as in the country. And we need, I think, to start by paying attention to the work of two thinkers I think that are very important. And I'm a moralist, so I'm focusing on morals here, not history or ecclesiology or systematics. Alistair McIntyre argued that a tradition is a living, historically extended argument about the goods internal to the tradition, the practices that constitute it, and the virtues that allow you to appropriate it. It's an argument. It's a discussion. And you're able to appreciate the discussion to the extent that you're shaped by the intellectual and moral virtues that enable you to participate in it. This requires, I think, detailed, nuanced, careful assessments both of the world and of what the tradition requires. In the legal realm, where we should turn for analysis is not to the litigators, but to the judges that write the common law opinions, which advance our understanding and advance our understanding of the law in ways that aren't necessarily bound by the binary oppositions of the lawyers that argue before them. In the Catholic moral life, I think we need to pay attention to the whole sweep of the moral tradition and how it's developed over time. We need creative fidelity, to quote Father Sullivan, who teaches at Boston College, or modeled in the work of my mentor, John Noonan, who showed how Catholic uh, doctrine on moral issues has developed over time in ways that are both consistent and new. How do we interact as we do this with the broader world? How do we act in a way that doesn't involve capitulation to secular values on the one hand or isolation on the other? Well, I too think we need to draw on Augustine's thought. 
and particularly his doctrine of the will. If we see ourselves and one another, as Augustine said, even when we're sinning as willing the good, we've got a point for conversation. If we see ourselves and one another as often willing the good in a distorted way, we have a point for critique. So I suggest we approach the broader culture by looking at first the question, what good is the person that we're interacting with willing? What do they want? And only then do I suggest that we engage it by saying, and how are they going wrong? That way we can be engaged but critical. We can be part of but not subsumed in. That way I think we can be faithful to the call both of the doctrine of creation and of the doctrine of redemption. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Well, as moderator, I now have the privilege of putting a question um, to our distinguished speakers, and then I will open the floor to you for your questions. So be ready. Um, I've heard the distinction between education and scholarship. I've heard uh, the suggestion that Catholic scholars should reframe the questions. I've heard that Catholic scholarship should tend toward ultimate meanings. I've heard Kathy suggest that we should take risks, not to be instrumental. Well, I'm a university administrator dealing with very practical issues. In light of all the things that you've said, what would distinguish a Catholic doctoral program, a doctoral program in English, say, in a Catholic university, or a doctoral program in biology in a Catholic university? from its counterpart in a secular institution. I'm, I'm asking about doctoral programs because I think that's the place in our universities where scholarship and education come closest to being intertwined. This is a very practical question for us at Boston College, and I suspect it's a practical question in other institutions as well. So please, anyone? Jean? Wow. Um, <clears throat> it's on. All right. Can I uh, answer your question by reframing the question? <laughs> um, I deserve that. Um, let, me give, let me give you an example of, from, from my field of history of how I think that, for example, Catholic historians might ask different questions, okay. which is a, is a way of avoiding your question, but you know, may, maybe actually in a way beginning an answer to it. Um, <clears throat> I, let, me, let me start with Kathleen's concluding remarks that one of the questions we might want to ask, for example, about, well, okay, I'm writing about capitalism right now, and one of the questions I'm asking is, you know, what, what good do people want? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of uh, a tiresome cliche to say that, that uh, you know, capitalism is about avarice and greed and, and all these other terrible things. I think fundamentally it's not. It's fundamentally about wanting a sacramental way of being in the world. It seems to me that this is what con consumer culture is about. Uh, this is what, uh, you know, I think Marx was onto something when he called it commodity fetishism. That's a profoundly religious insight, uh, if we realize it. Those are the sorts of questions that I think Catholics, Catholic historians can ask, but they can do it only if, it seems to me, they have a theological architecture of some kind for their work. Uh, rather than simply asking the same old questions that historians ask about any number of subjects, and guess what? You'll get the same old answers, except they will be given by Catholics, which to me is not an advance. Now, Catholic doctoral program, if I can attempt to answer your question, uh, would, would maybe have uh, all their historians read, oh, Augustine. Have them read The City of God which I would think is, the, is sort of the inaugural document uh, of Christian thought about history. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Michael. Well, just a thought. It's a vast question. Uh, it seems to me, is this thing on? Yeah, it okay. is. Okay, if we can share. Um, if it's a Catholic program, 
and that was the way you specified it, then it seems to me it's got to be a community. That, that <laughs> somehow or other, the, uh, the members of this group that are studying and have devoted all those imperishable pearls. Okay, gang, where are we? No place. Your machine is broken. Here, we'll share. The time. There you are. Give that to a close friend. Oh, it's, a, it's better now. All right. Don't go away. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. As I was saying, um, I think if it's a Catholic program, you've got to have community. You don't have Catholicism with each individual monad interrelating even in a contractual way one with another. If it's a Catholic program, just because it's in a Catholic university and you have nuns and priests and whatever teaching, doesn't mean it's a Catholic program. Can you still get me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I think what you have to have is you have to have um, um, some way in which this group of people are bound to one another in a common effort to advance their own studies and so forth. And I would think that would be uh, absolutely crucial. And that it would, the, the way they are bound together would not be simply uh, individual social moments, but a whole, in other words, a Catholic program, a whole liturgical, um, 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 I'm distracted, a whole liturgical, social, uh, care for one another kind of community. I think I've got to switch mics here. Well, I have no idea what, what the, get off your knees. This is absurd. <laughs> Can you hear me with, I don't use this damn thing. You can't, all right. All right, now we have three microphones up here. Should that do it? And I don't know how much you got of the, the what I was saying before. Shall I repeat it, let summarize it? I think if it's going to be a Catholic program, you've got to have a community of people who care for one another, or you haven't got a Catholic program. I think that would be part of the function of the administration to see that, both to tell the students as they come that this is what we, we do expect you to care for one another, you know, it, it is a Catholic program. And we do have things like liturgy and discussions and so forth in which you do get to know one another best. I don't mean a cascade of obligations, but I do mean that uh, there are moments in which people that are living a lonely uh, existence as uh, doctoral students need to feel the reinforcement of one another. So that would be something I'd put in very strongly. It's yours. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if I've got a positive answer for the question, but I do think I have a couple of things we need to avoid in answering it. One thing that sometimes happens when you talk about, well, what, what is Catholic thought in other fields like law or English or biology, is what you get are people who think what they need to do is become theologians and then sort of apply it to their particular area. So, and then what you end up with is sort of bad theology applied to another discipline. And, and that's not gonna help anybody either, I think, in terms of advancing knowledge, because it's, it's, it's not going to be as integrated as, as, as you want, and it's not going to, well, advance knowledge or advance the intersection any more than somebody trying to become a historian or trying to learn a little bit about law or trying to learn a little bit about philosophy and bringing it into their discipline is going to, is going to do any good. Each discipline, including theology, has, you know, has, has, has a wealth of knowledge and information and formation behind it, and that needs to be taken seriously. You can't just pick that up in a summer course. So we don't want to turn people into mini theologians on the one hand. I guess I would prefer to say, in, at that level, is what we want is people bringing a Catholic sensibility to the questions that they have. And that includes, I think, not just the formation of the community, but a sense of the horizon of their disciplines and the sort of questions that they're going to ask that moves out beyond them. That would certainly include questions of ethics. Um, and you know, we always talk about ethics, and that's the first place Catholic graduate programs go when they're trying to be Catholics. Well, we gotta get ourselves some ethics here. But I think it's also about other senses or aspects of a Catholic sensibility. 
uh, symbolic meaning, you know, um, exploring or being sensitive to what the, the meaning of what you're working on has in a broader context. So in science, for example, What's the role of the genome? What does the genome symbolize, you know, as, as, a, as something that we all know about, all think about? Um, and, and so what you need in order to train Catholics to do this isn't just, you know, a bit of theology. It's also an enculturation into a sacramental worldview, into a sense of what creation and redemption mean, and in a sense of how knowledge fits into that. Let me ask one more. Um, this is a, a Reframing, I think, of, of uh, or rephrasing of Father Leahy's question that began with, we began this afternoon with. Catholic intellectuals have often, in the history of the church, had a difficult relationship with the church. What do you think the role or the relationship should be between the Catholic intellectual and the church? And by church, I mean not only magisterium, but I do mean magisterium, but also the people of God in the pews. That, that, that's like asking, what do you think of civilization? It's so, it's, <laughs> it, it's so vast that uh, I will say a couple of things about it. Um, that um, the magisterium is God's gift to the church in such a way that it, the church can uh, discern its way and so forth in a world, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also obvious problems, enormous problems, and so forth. I do think um, what is absolutely essential is a mutual patience. The, um, the, the local bishop may think that what you're saying at, at the university is terribly irresponsible, and you may think the bishop is slightly to the right of Bismarck. And, and, but if you dismiss each other with contempt, that's the end of it. I, I would think that in terms of the, the, the magisterium of the church in general, the, the virtue that is needed is reverence, a reverence for the person that is there, that is doing this job, whether it be a teacher or whatever, and a reverence which allows you to talk one with another with a certain modicum of trust so that you can, um, you, you can build something that's constructive. Um, I'm reminded of something that Eugene Genovese uh, once said when he was um, still a Marxist. Uh, in the 1960s, and there's something I think of an analogy here. Uh, he, he was asked, well, how can radical scholars be relevant to the struggles of, of oppressed peoples, and how, how can radical scholars um, help the cause? And Genovese said very simply, be a good historian, period. You don't have to feel that you have to politicize everything you do. Uh, you don't immediately go into attack mode. Um, you don't immediately go into polemical mode. The best thing you can do is simply be very good at the discipline in which, to which you've dedicated yourself. I think that's the best answer he could possibly have given, rather than you know grandstand, um, of which there's you know far too much. I tend to approach questions like this sort of and. Well, in a parallel fashion, because I, 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 I'm part of two normative traditions. On the one hand, I'm part of the tradition with the authority of, of the Roman Catholic community, but I'm also a lawyer and a law professor and part of the tradition that has normative uh, you know, capacity and authority of, of the American legal tradition. And on a couple of points, I think that the theological tradition might do well to kind of look at the legal tradition, just in terms of structure, not in terms of, uh, of you know, moral content necessarily. Um, legal academic, in the legal system, you've got legal academics, you have practicing lawyers and people, and you also have judges. And I, I sometimes think that the role of a, a bishop is more or less analogous to the role of a judge. Our bishops are very, um, our judges are very, very learned. They're, they're very smart people. It's a very prestigious job. And they're charged with deciding particular cases before them and running the community as it is. And the legal academics are off doing their job and thinking, but they're not necessarily immediately coming up with solutions or practical uh, 
programs that are going to hit the the um, you know the legal system day one, day two, and everybody understands that the role of the theologian and the role or the role of the judge and the role of the legal academic are different but complementary. I think we need to also understand that the role of the theologian and the role of the bishop are different and complementary. The theologians have more time, more space, more chance to think through issues in greater detail and sometimes what they think through isn't going to be practically workable or it isn't going to be accepted right away, but it's important to have them. And at the same time, you have to have people who are charged with doing practical theology, with working for the community as it is now, and, and, and dealing with the problems and the possibilities of the church as it is now. So I, I think that uh, a mutual respect for each other's tasks is, is, uh, is part of the reverence that Father Buckley